Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Fellows 2017 launch webinar. Uh, my name is Shweb Sufi, and I'm the community lead at the Software Sustainability Institute. Okay, some practicalities. Um, if you're experiencing any problems or uh, you have any questions, uh, then please use this Etherpad. Um, you can use the chat in the Citrix as well, uh, but that just um, that just comes to me. Uh, but the questions, we would recommend you put them into the Etherpad so other people can see um, other people can see what you're, you're what you're asking. Uh, we are we are recording the webinar, so a recording will be made available, um, and that's just our Twitter handle. Okay, so what do we aim to cover? So we're going to give an introduction to the Software Sustainability Institute for those of you who don't know what the institute's about. Uh, we're also going to talk about the fellowship program. Um, what we're looking for in 2017, what some of the rules are, uh, some tips for application, uh, and we're going to have a brief look at the, uh, the program up to now um, and some ha ha highlight various things uh, about the program. And we also have an opportunity towards the end to uh, answer your questions. The agenda, uh, I'm making the introduction. Um, well, making the welcome, then we'll move on to the introduction um, uh, and then discuss the fellowship program. Uh, then we'll have some some of the fellows' experiences, some of the fellows have joined us today and they will be talking about their experiences as fellows, uh, why they applied, um, how it's been as a fellow, uh, and then we'll get a chance to do Q&A. So um, I'm aiming to run the Q&A off the, off the Etherpad, so please use the Etherpad address which is in the chat box in Citrix in the GoToWebinar panel to uh, pop your questions in. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to give a brief introduction to the to the Institute itself. So what is the Software Sustainability Institute? Well, the Software Sustainability Institute is a national facility for cultivating world-class research through software. So we believe that better software enables better research, uh, as do our funders. Um, we believe that we've got experience of software products uh, reaching natural, natural boundaries in their development uh, that pr prevent their improvement and growth and adoption. Uh, and so one of the main things that we do is we provide expertise and advice to help people to, to grow their software and get it to the next stage. As well as this, there's a whole um, ecosystem of activities which are associated with the people who work in in research software. We run programs such as the fellowship program, we run events, um, whether they're training events or, or workshops. We also have policy initiatives where we are uh, investigating um, the use and uptake of research software in the community. And we have tools to help people evaluate um, their own uh, maturity, as it were, in research software to help really support the, the community developing software. And that's not just the community of software developers, but that's also managers, funders, publishers, uh, and project leaders. The institute itself is, um, has five main teams. Um, it has a software team, uh, which really help um, work with software projects um, and help them uh, through consultancy to either improve their code base so that they can grow or help them uh, in more strategic ways. We also have a training theme, uh, and uh, we really focus on helping uh, researchers develop their software skills um, and increasing core competent competencies in various uh, software engineering techniques, uh, such as testing or automation, uh, which should help um, them produce better software. Uh, we also have a, a policy um, initiative, which is really looking at studying the software community to really uh, highlight various factors uh, about the community to, to sh really show um, the types of terms that I'd be using to describe software orientated roles, um, the, uh, the amount of software being used and how much software is depended, uh, is depend depended upon. We also have a community theme uh, where we run workshops and bring people together to discuss topical issues, whether that's software and credit or whether that's um, IP and uh, software. Um, or whether that's reproducible research, uh, and we also run the fellowship program to help support uh, to help uh, support the, the network of people who are uh, trying to improve software practice. 
So, just a brief overview of the uh, the amount of work that we've done in this area. Um, so we've done since our inception back in 2010. We've done over 62 consultancy projects, a wide variety of software domains and tools and languages and groups. Uh, we've had 200 plus evaluations uh, to help people uh, see the maturity of their software for surgeries where we've been uh, and really helped people uh, uh, in their work environment to, to see what their potential problems are. Um, we've run over 100 uh, software carpentry courses. Uh, these are training courses in core competencies and research skills. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, software carpentry later. We've supported over 2,500 learners. We have 80 guides um, on the website all to do with, such as, you know, for example, if your software developer is leaving, the type of things that you might want to get them to do before handover. Um, uh, we've had many readers. Um, our website is very popular. We have over 15,000 visitors per month, uh, many Twitter followers. We have, uh, the fellowship network has grown over the years from when it was run, started to run in 2012. We have 78 uh, fellows now. Um, and they really do act as domain ambassadors. Uh, we're engaging a, a larger and larger portion of the research software engineering community with 650 uh, research software engineers in, in touch. We uh, don't, we, we're not very centralized. Uh, we tend to go out and work with the community where they're based. For example, uh, the, uh, here are some of the sites that fellows are based at. Um, you can see the different areas where we've done software carpentry workshops. You can see where we've run other workshops. Um, and we have uh, project partners or people who are doing uh, consultancy projects for. We also have a, a wide and varied uh, advisory board. And it might give you an indication of the, the geographic spread of interaction that we've had uh, with others across the UK. So one of the things I wanted to highlight was one of the outputs from the, uh, the, the policy program where we run a, a, uh, a survey of uh, Russell Group universities uh, and they uh, came up with this uh, result which was really interesting that 92% of researchers that we that responded uh, use software and nearly 70% of people said that, that their research would be impossible without software. So this is, a, this is the start of some of the real figures showing that um, a lot of the research uh, in the UK is, is particularly software driven and therefore um, why there needs to be a focus in this area and that's the focus that the, the Institute uh, is working on. Okay, so that's the introduction to the, uh, the Institute done. Um, again, if you have any, any questions, um, please do uh, put them in the, uh, the etherpad. Um, and you can see the address there, it's etherpad.net forward slash p forward slash fellows 2017 hyphen webinar. It's also in the chat box on the bottom right hand corner. Um, okay, now I'll move on to talking about the fellowship program uh, itself. So, why did we start a fellowship program? Well, one of the aims of the program is to engage with uh, natural ambassadors of better software practice from the research community. There are people working uh, in the in the wi a wide variety of research um, uh, domains who are in their own way trying to improve software practice, either trying to uh, run workshops, trying to run lunchtime sessions, trying to run uh, sessions at different times. Um, um, let me just paste, I'm just going to paste the Etherpad link um, again for those who might not have seen it. Um, so uh, one of the things that the Institute particularly focused on is knowing what the important software uh, tools are in, in particular domains to see how best we can help uh, support that work and increase training in th those areas. And it also helps us guide our consultancy engagements, which areas to focus on, type of policy research we do, uh, and also future community work in terms of uh, what the focus is of what the focus of workshops should be um, on topical issues. Um, 
we also felt there was a need to uh, to help the people who are working in this area. Um, they certainly gain credibility and, and networking, and uh, we offer support for those who are trying to improve software practice. Um, and we also believe that the, the promotion of better software sustainability practices is best done by those in the domains. There's a certain amount of work that the Institute can and does do uh, in a generic way, but those who are actually in the research domain themselves are, tend to be able to tailor the advice and know the issues in their particular domain, so they are best placed. Uh, and we also believe that people at different career stages have something to offer, that's why we um, the, the fellowship program is open to people from a wide variety of career stages. Um, so who are we looking for? As I mentioned, we're looking for people from a variety of career stages, from early careers, whether you're a PhD student or a new RA, um, or a lecturer, or established RA, or a fellowship, uh, or even more later in the career, uh, senior RAs or senior lecturers, readers and professors. We've certainly had all of uh, all of those types uh, of of uh, people from those various career stages um, as fellows. So what are we looking for? So we're looking for people across the RC UK uh, space. Um, we're specifically funded by EPSRC, BBRC, BBSRC, and ESRC, but it's not restricted to people from those domains. The people should have a specific interest in software, they'd be able to identify relevant software in their domain, uh, they'll be using research software, uh, they'll be involved in technology standards potentially, they might develop their own codes, they might manage its production, uh, they might promote the use of software in their domain, uh, they might have a blog or, or tweet about software related topics, or there might be other ways in which they have a, a connection with software. They need to be able to determine how, uh, whether and how the Institute could help them. Um, they need to be a, make a clear case of how they would champion uh, improved software practice in their domain or institute. Um, ideally, we're looking for people who are, are excellent communicators, people who, are, who blog and tweet or have done public engagement work or authors of, of books and articles. Um, so a real contribution towards their research community. Um, and people are linked or embedded in at least one research network which has some connection with software, which is most people who work in research. So, um, and one, an important point, it's not just a competition. It's not just a competition that you want to, uh, to win just for the sake of winning. Um, but it's important that you have the time to engage. Uh, so on average, it, it takes about eight days of engagement uh, a year. But that's not eight days where you're solely working for us. This is time where there is uh, the win-win is in, in operation. Um, you're reporting back on your own events that you've attended, um, you, or you may be attending a couple of events from the, the institute where you're, you're collaborating and networking with people and learning new ways of uh, running workshops or, um, or connecting with people. Um, so these are indicative things that we expect from people from different career stages. Um, you know, the early people in the earlier career stage, did they have the time and inclination to contribute? For example, if they're, if they're running up to their, their Viva, um, it's not exactly going to be the best time potentially for them. Uh, do they want to travel to conferences, um, that they meet people, uh, that they use their platform to bring intelligence to the Institute uh, in terms of what's happening in their area, uh, to pr promote the Institute. Uh, they intend the uh, annual collaborations workshop. I'll come more I'll come on to some more of the requirements shortly. Perhaps they're interested in organizing a software carpentry workshop or a different type of workshop. Uh, the mid-career folk are very much more focused on uh, all the early, they might do all the things that the early career folk are doing, uh, plus they're more, more focused on running workshops or contributing towards policy or, or helping with the review or talking about the Institute and its work or the importance of some of the topics that the Institute raises with their community. Those more later in the career um, really might be focused on other things and chairing uh, events um, around policy uh, and promoting the Institute and its mission to research leaders in the Institute uh, and research councils um, and offering some review of the Institute itself and its activities and giving their input and thoughts and uh, 
So these are just uh, these are indicative expectations. You know, we are open in your application process to 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 see other ideas that you may have, other other insights that you may have. So what we promise to do is we promise to listen uh, and be responsive, uh, and we deal we we do promise to deal with you as one of the team. Our fellows are very dear to us, and um, they do make the institute what it is. Uh, and we we will certainly support your, your work and ideas as a fellow. Um, if you come to us with an idea of something that you do, we do try, uh, we do approve each event that fellows uh, ask. It gives us the opportunity to help, um, number one, know what the fellows are doing, number two, connect them with other relevant people um, to help improve the impact of the work that they do. And we promise to be fair and flexible where possible. Um, for example, if something's come up and you have to uh, uh, book late, we, that's fine. <laughs> so benefits, um, really these are indicative again, early, mid and late. You get to attend more conferences, you get to present your work, you raise your profile, you know, identify your software in the domain, you have your opinions heard, uh, you can gain some teaching experience uh, and publishing opportunities, uh, you can get higher visibility within your institution potentially new collaborations by attending workshops. Certainly some of the fellows in the past have become the kind of go-to people for software oriented things in their, in their groups, which has been a, a boon for them and their groups. Become a thought leader in the area. Uh, and you do, you know, it, the sky's the limit really. You can, um, you know, influence national policy in this area. And some of our fellows have been, by, um, have been invited to, you know, panels run by research councils to help really influence the way they should be handling data management and software management. So the benefits are there for uh, creating a platform so that you feel empowered. Many people have said they felt empowered to be able to speak about software practice as they have this badge of a fellow, um, to connect out to a community and also learning opportunities. People, um, quite skilled people have said, oh, actually, I've realized there's gaps in my learning from uh, whether it's technology or whether it's in outreach. Uh, which they've been able to benefit from by being a fellow. So the requirements of being a fellow, uh, once people are selected, uh, are they agree to the terms and conditions and kind of for each supported event they write a blog post. I mean, I'm talking about this so that you know about the commitment of being a fellow. Um, you attend the fellows inaugural meeting, which I'll speak about shortly. Uh, you attend the collaborations workshop. Um, is a midterm review. Uh, that's only an hour over Skype just to see how you're going on, how you're delivering according to plan, whether there's been any changes or delay, because those things do happen. And at the end of your fellowship, an exit interview to see how the fellowship has gone so we can track um, the benefits of the fellowship and, and tweak the fellowship for subsequent years. Uh, and this is also evidence for the research councils to help carry on uh, supporting these programs. Here's the timeline. I won't go through this in detail. The main thing to focus on here is the if you are shortlisted, uh, you'll know about this. Uh, the, well, sorry, the deadline for applications being quite strict uh, on the night of Sunday, the 2nd of October. Um, and if you're shortlisted, you'll find out on Thursday, October the 20th. Uh, and then we have a face-to-face -face, uh, selection meeting in Manchester where your travel is paid for on, the, on November the 2nd. Um, so please do hold the date if at all possible. If this is impossible, then and you and you and you do apply, please get in touch. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of you are probably very interested in, uh, which is the application form. Now the questions I've put here are not in the order that they are in on the application form. All of the questions on the application form are important, but some are traditionally more important than others. Um, so I just wanted to talk through some of uh, some of those. So the top line, I would say, are the, is the most important questions people that we, we do look at. We look at your standing in the community, um, and people read this first line, give include up to three impactful or relevant publications, and then stop there. And, and if they're not a publisher of articles, they start worrying. But if you read on, uh, or software, or blogs, or workshops, or committees, or other examples. So these are all kind of exclusive, or as it were, you can you can show 
uh, or there can be normal ors. You can you can show a variety of things, and you don't have to put down any papers. You know, so and uh, what have you done already, as it were, to to show that you are the right sort of person to to carry on engaging with your community or to grow that engagement with the community. And the other, and that, this naturally leads on to the next very important question, which is, if you're awarded the fellowship, what what do you plan to do as an institute fellow? So this is something that people uh, specifically focus on to the extent that if there was a two candidates that look pretty similar at shortlisting, they would tend to focus on the plans that the that the fellows have. Then we're interested in you describing your work uh, and how it intersects with software uh, and describing experiences of communicating your work. Then why do things on your thoughts on sustaining uh, research software? You know, why do you think it's important to sustain research software? Then more specifically, problems and use cases that you've seen in your area of work or in your domain where you thought more sustainable software would help. This helps us understand your insight into software in, in your domain. The other thing I would add was, uh, and this is linked at the top of the application form, is that we, we really recommend that you, um, for these longer questions, you actually prepare the answers in a document, an offline document, as it were, or an online document, some, some, a document somewhere, uh, and then paste them in when, when you're actually going to submit the form. So don't develop your answers in the form because the form is not, not persistent. If you close the tab, you will most likely lose your, your answers. Okay, I'm going to talk uh, a few minutes about just highlighting the, the, the fellowship program at the moment and fleshing out some of the things that I, that I stated. Uh, it might give you some ideas but they, about what to do in your own application, but it's certainly not the ideas are certainly not restricted to the things that I'm mentioning. Okay, some stats. So this is the current fellows in 2016. They're announced in December uh, 2015. So um, you can see that we have a uh, good male-female split, and you can see that traditionally we tend to get more people in the middle career, uh, although there are people in their late and early career too. And you can see how this compares to um, fellows 2015, um, where there were certainly more uh, male candidates uh, and um, you can see again there's a focus on the middle uh, but we certainly do support early um, and, and late that tends to be reflected by the people who apply um, and if you're worried at all that why do you have less female um, fellows than male fellows then one of the interesting things is uh, from analyzing the data is that the the number of applications from females tends to be about 20%, um, but the number of fellows that actually get awarded tend to be higher. So on average, we think that the female applications are of higher quality. So that might be a, that's an interesting fact, I think. Okay, in terms of the fellows areas, what are we looking for? Well, there's no, no specific, uh, I've mentioned some of the research areas like ESRC, BBSRC, EPSRC, I mean there will be a focus on those areas but it's certainly not exclusive. People who are naturally funded by MRC, AHRC, um, NERC, uh, STFC, they, they are, have also been awarded fellowships. It's really, you know, 99% of it is on the strength of your fellowship application. You can see that, uh, uh, you can go and have a look at the fellows profiles to uh, see, uh, to take a look at what uh, each fellow does uh, in their work and um, you can see that there are a variety of research areas and we're looking for people for, for more um, from a wide variety also. So one of the things that we ask, people, ask the fellows to do is to write blogs. Um, I won't dwell too long on this but it's, it's, a, it's a way of um, getting the expertise or getting the insights you did from running an event out to the community. That's why we tie it closely in with uh, the process of uh, being reimbursed. Um, you don't get reimbursed as a fellow unless you've written your blog post. Um, the blog is very uh, well read with 15,000 visitors uh, a month. Okay, so as well as um, fellows attending workshops and conferences and writing reports on what they've seen and the discussions that they've had, what are the things that they do? Well, fellows have got a strong focus 
it's not exclusively what fellows have done. There's one other activities too, but fellows have, have got a strong focus on organising their own workshops. For example, they came together in 20, uh, set of them came together in 2013 uh, at the annual geophysical union to run a software and research town hall. Um, there was the there also this um, move towards combining different people with different skills. There was the clinical scientists and the statisticians coming together uh, at UCL by Liberty Foreman to see if they could create collaborations. There was also the idea of the paper hackathon by Derek Grohn, who was at UCL at the time, uh, uh, now at Brunel, who uh, was, was bringing together software people and uh, bio, bio people to see if they could go on a retreat and, and, and actually produce a scientific paper in a short period of time. There was an agent-based modelling workshop uh, where we were paying for um, the recording of uh, information that was going to later be turned into a course. That's a benchmarking workshop uh, and PyCon UK uh, support for Sarah Mao and there was kind of mentorship in digital history by James Baker uh, where it was really promoting uh, the digital. Um, the Research Software Engineer community uh, at www.rse.ac.uk will have their first conference next week uh, here in, Manch in, in Manchester. Um, some of the key players in that, James Hetherington, Mark Stillwell, uh, and the organiser, the, uh, the chair uh, of the organising committee of the workshop, uh, are all fellows. Fellows also take a, a very keen interest in um, in software carpentry. What is software carpentry? Software carpentry is an international initiative and it's focused on teaching core competence and competencies in software engineering. Um, so testing, uh, automation, version control, things which will really are, are building blocks of um, uh, improving uh, software, improving reproducibility uh, and improving quality. So. Not all fellows, but maybe half of the fellows who apply tend to have an interest in running a software carpentry workshop. And some of them then move on to kind of train the trainer type events where they learn about, uh, in, they become instructors. Uh, and the instructors aren't instructed in a particular tool or technology, but they're instructed in um, kind of like psychology and best practice in, in training uh, and point, putting together training courses uh, and, and programs. So it has a wider benefit for them as um, as fellows in their, in their research and teaching career. Um, and some of them have taken this on a step further. Um, they've developed their own software carpentry style uh, work. For example, James Hetherington at UCL has used software carpentry inspired methods at UCL for longer uh, courses, or James Baker's um, tailored the approach for the library community and called it library carpentry. Um, or the established software package which you, um, from Alexander Konovalov, um, who's, who's part of the uh, team putting together GAP, um, you know, they've reformatted their um, training material. Um, there's also um, a clinician, Steve Harris, who's started up Data Science for Doctors, which is uh, taking the software carpentry approach. And under development is work by Heather Ford, looking at developing kind of social science carpentry, looking at social science skills, uh, but taking the approach um, advocated by uh, software and data carpentry. Um, in terms of as a new fellow, one of the things you'll be asked to attend uh, is an inaugural meeting. Uh, we had this back in February 2016, where people get an, uh, you can see some of the fellows there from 2016, they get an introduction to the institute. A uh, chance to network and get their plans uh, appraised and get feedback from the other fellows. One of the other things we ask fellows to attend is a collaborations workshop. Uh, it really kind of brings people together from different backgrounds. It's an on-conference. You get a chance to decide what's being discussed. Um, we held it at the Royal College of Surgeons. You don't have to be a fellow to attend collaborations workshops. At this time, we had a focus on software and credit. And many fellows re-attend. For example, one of our fellows, Robin Wilson, he, he was a winner for the hack, he was a hackathon winner in 2015 for his work on Recipe. Uh, and when he came back in 2016, came back as a judge, uh, judging the other hackathon entries. Um, the slides will be made available, so you don't have to note all these down. Um, but the, uh, the collaborations workshop, the dates are already set for for 2017, that take part in, in take
place in Leeds. Um, there's also um, this concept of kind of fellows forever or what we call continuing fellowship. So once your fellowship comes to an end, uh, it's not bye-bye, it's like we want to carry on engaging, we, we carry on calling you a fellow, you can carry on updating your profile, you'll stay on the email list, you stay on our Slack group. Uh, but then there's a communal part of funds available uh, where you can, if you want to attend an event which you don't have any other funds for, or if you want part funding for an event, uh, again, we'll ask for your opinion, you get a chance to network, um, and your influence continues, and, uh, and many, many of the continuing fellows also help with, with fellows recruitment. Okay, here's some of the some links. Um, I, there's a couple of them that are in the uh, the Etherpad also. Okay. okay, so now we're going to move on to. Uh, we have a few of the fellows with us. Um, we've kindly given up their time, so uh, we're going to. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Vincent Knight, uh, who's going to talk about his experiences and, and reasons for for being a fellow and, and for applying. So Vincent, I believe you have the screen now. Great, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um so yes, I've got a, a little presentation that I'm just gonna go um through now, I believe that's on, on, uh, on the screen. Let me see if I can get rid of that. Um, so I'm a mathematician at Cardiff uh, University, and I'm uh, a fellow of the 2016 um, class. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, my own experiences of uh, becoming and being a, a fellow. Uh, so what I do, um, I have... Uh, I, I'm a lecturer at Cardiff, and so I've got three kind of strands. Um, uh, my research, I look at stochastic uh, modeling, mainly applied to, to healthcare, and I study game theory. Um, I, I'm one of the core developers for a, a Python package called Axelrod, which um, studies the iterated prisoner's dilemma. Um, in uh, my teaching, I teach Python, I also teach SAS and R, and I run uh, the school's uh, code club. And um, I also do a, uh, a fair bit of outreach, so I go into, into schools and um, I'm involved in uh, two PyCons, notably uh, the UK one and the Namibian one, and I also help run the Cardiff uh, Python user group. So, so software really um, underpins a, a lot of uh, what I do. And that kind of brings me on to why, why did I apply to become um, a fellow. Um, to further my own development, um, when I understood and learned about the, the fellowship uh, scheme, I thought it would be a really good opportunity to, uh, to continue to, to uh, learn and, and understand various things about, about software by, by kind of immersing myself in this community of, of people who know lots of things about software um, from different points of view. Uh, to get some recognition for, uh, for the software development um, I, I do, and that's an important aspect in terms of uh, being able to say that I am a, uh, a fellow of the, the, the SSI, is, um, it has a level of recognition around it which is, uh, which is valuable. And um, r really it's, uh, it's the, the people. Um, uh, the the main, main reason I, I applied was because I was speaking to other fellows um, so uh, Alexander and uh, Sarah Mount, um, who said that uh, it would be a good idea to apply, and I looked into it, and that's uh, that's kind of what brought me towards the application process. Um, in terms of the commitment, uh, this this is my original plan. So my original plan uh, was slash is to uh, run a, a workshop at. PyCon on uh, on stochastic modeling, as well as another workshop looking at, at game theory. There are minor things that um, that's not quite gone exactly to plan, but that's still uh, one area of uh, of the commitment. And um, being able to talk this over with other fellows uh, at the the mid 
midterm. I don't know if that's quite the right word. Uh, the midterm, the midpoint uh, process was super valuable, and to get lots of insights on that uh, was very, very helpful. But one of the other uh, commitments is throughout the various meetings that Schwab is uh, uh, described, um, you write blog posts, and that's uh, a super valuable um, process, and it's nice to have something you've written on the SSI uh, website. But um, but also it's it's valuable to to have these write writing these blog posts with other uh, fellows and other other uh, software developers. Um, this photo is from the collaborations uh, workshop, which which you have to go to as a uh, as a fellow um, in 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 your year. Uh, you you you're you're forced to go to this, and I I'm kind of emphasizing the, the forced because frankly it was one of the the best uh, the best conferences workshops I've I've ever been to. Um, it was just three uh, three or four days I forget exactly three or four days of uh, working with like-minded people from a variety of different areas, and this was super super valuable. So I'm already looking forward to the next one, and um, it, it's it's not as much a commitment but an opportunity. So um, this was this is really really a positive aspect, and another kind of positive aspect is related to the selection process. So uh, you write an application, and then after, after that application, if it's successful, you go to a selection day. And um, frankly, that's also a very, very positive experience. Even, even if you don't get the fellowship, I think, um, so if I, if I hadn't been lucky enough to get the fellowship, I would have still gained a lot just from, go, from going to that selection day. Once again, just interacting with all these different individuals from uh, across all sorts of different dimensions. So, um, you know, different subject areas, um, for example, uh, but also different uh, points of their career. I think that's a wonderful thing about this fellowship is that is that all these fellows interact. Um, and then just that leads me on to one of the benefits because really the commitments are all benefits in in my eyes. Um, but it's the main benefit I would say is that community of of people. Um, you are as a fellow, you are one small resource of the SSI in that as a fellow you're you're kind of looked to for your opinions and your your insight um, from the point of view of such development. But that's just one little role and, and more often than not I find myself asking questions and being able to readily tap into this, this vast resource that is the SSI and the SSI fellows. Um, so here for example was one question I put on the SSI Slack channel uh, one day and was flooded with really great answers and um, and further questions, actually. So, so uh, I think I think the benefits of being a fellow are are fantastic, and and really the commitments I would I would all consider them to be to be benefits. And I, I think that's that's all I wanted to say at at this point about my experience of uh, being a fellow. So, I'll, I'll hand back over to um, uh, Schwab, I believe, at this point. Hi. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks for that excellent uh, overview of your reasons and benefits. Um, okay, so I think we can now move on to um, James. Uh, so I'm going to unmute James. Um, so James, if there's a problem with you, uh, if you, if, if you just give it a try. Button. How about that? <laughs> Excellent. Please. I should Please. show my screen with, 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 yes. with the top four track in the right hand window. It should be okay. Is that yeah. okay? Jeff? Yeah, can see it. Okay. Uh, so I'm James Davenport, and as you can see from the last line on this slide, I'm what uh, Schwab would have called one of the late group. Um, I, uh, I joined Bath uh, to join the School of Mathematical Sciences. Uh, Fifteen years ago, it split into two departments of maths and computer science, and I objected so loudly to this split that the vice chancellor said, well, you can be in both departments, uh, which describes very well where I am. And, um, and Almost 10 years ago, the university decided to get into high performance computing, and all the science professors said we should get into it. 
and the pro bias charts research said, how are we going to do that? And they said, well, James can do it. So this is, in some sense, one of the reasons why I'm here is because I run the university type forms computer as well as doing my own research, which is very much computational mathematics. So intellectually, I'm not that far from Vince. Our slides are also somewhat similar. I hasten to add we haven't collaborated at all on this. So why did I apply? Uh, not sure I can kill, I can kill these. Um, I've been writing programs for many, many years and done quite a lot for long-term projects. I actually learned from my mistakes. Very recently, I had to go and rerun the code from my 1979 PhD thesis. And while I could run all the core parts, I couldn't run some of the options. So I've lived and learned a bit there. And um, one of the things I've learned, the fundamental lesson is that the difference between software and hardware is that software lives on. Hardware just gets retired. Software doesn't get retired nearly as often. Um, so although I knew quite a lot, I had no sort of formal qualifications as such. I also really wanted to connect to the community. Uh, things were happening on the research software engineer front. I want to be connected to these. I want to feed these back into the university, which at that point had no, and so in this case, yeah, it has no fellows other than me. Uh, so before me, it had no fellows. Um, and also, although I thought I knew a fair amount, I was one of those people who the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. And I wanted the learning opportunities, both the more formal ones, and also just for community learning, being connected with a bunch of people outside this university who could tell me things I didn't know, or suggest that I look at things from different points of view. Um, and I wanted to contribute and also to find out. I've certainly learned things that probably wrongly don't seem to be publishable, but do, me, but do seem worth passing on. And I've had the opportunity to do that at a couple of workshops I've contributed to, uh, run by other fellows. I haven't run any fellow any workshops myself yet. Um, what well, we got out of it so far, I've certainly got out of it a much better understanding of the RSC world. And based on that, I've been arguing to the university for research software engineering investment, and we've certainly got half of one. I'm, I'm currently writing the case to turn it into a full one, and we're being awarded a new supercomputer across the region, and it looks as if I'll be coordinating the regional pool of RSEs. Uh, again, that's only because of my fellowship, I think. I, I've got out of it a wonderful group of people to bounce ideas off or just check my judgment. Um, and it's people with no vested interest in my decision, typically, unlike people in my own university, so that's great. Uh, at the last collaborations workshop, and I endorse everything being said about how one it is, we started writing a paper about what testing means for research software, and alas, that's still in draft, because uh, once you walk away from collaborations workshop, the day job takes over, rather. I'm really rather sorry about that. I keep uh, trying to push my colleagues to collaborate, and we can never find a, a joint time to do this. So I, I need to have another go at that one. And again, training opportunities. I ain't been doing a formal software carpentry course in January. Uh, so I want, I do quite a lot of training as well as uh, uh, formal teaching. Uh, and I want to improve my skills in that area. What have I contributed? Well, I'm here. Um, I've done various other events of talking to potential new fellows and so on. I've spoken at two seminars organized by other fellows, and I'm very grateful to them. And uh, I know I ought to organize one myself, but uh, I might do one coming out of a new supercomputer as and when there's something to report on there isn't really yet. And I'm working on software citation. Um, in the mass community, there's somewhat of a move to formalize this and to improve it, and I'm sort of liaising between that and the Mac community and the people in the Software Sustainability Institute who are interested in standards in software citation. Um, and just making software citation more visible, we uh, 
we live in a world of increased citation counting as at least the first stab in evaluation. I hope to God it's not the only stab, but too many people, too many people do that. And therefore, getting software citation both increased and more systematized will, I think, be good for the entire software community. Uh, and I've probably spoken enough, so I'm happy to answer questions when we come to the chat phase of this thing. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, James. Uh, okay. Uh, now we're going to move on to um, Alexander uh, Konovalov. Um, He's going to be giving his presentation. Hello? Hello. So can you see my screen? Yeah, see the screen? I can hear your voice. Right, okay, one second. I will make a full screen mode. Okay, so hello, I'm Alexander Kanavalov. Uh, research Fellow in Center of Interdisciplinary Research of Computational Algebra, University of St. Andrews, and I am a Fellow of uh, 2014 uh, year. So my background is computational algebra. I am using computers for mathematical research, so I am combining both uh, user and contributor to the computer algebra system called GAP, open source software. And I'm involved in many aspects of uh, development of GAP, release management, testing, package management, user support, and others. What naturally led me to an interest in applying for Software Sustainability Institute uh, Fellowship at the end of 2015. So uh, in my talk, I would like more reflect on what was happening to me after the first year of the fellowship. I cannot say after the fellowship because once a fellow, forever fellow. So, but during the first year, I spoke on a recomputation project at Scottish Programming Languages Seminar in Dundee. I attended Collaborations Workshop 2014 in Oxford and the Hack Day, and that was really a fantastic event. So after that, I made all efforts to attend all ne next collaboration workshops. I went to the Microsoft Azure training course in Manchester, attended SSI Fellows Meteor meeting, uh, then, in St. Andrews in August, we organized experimental methodology and computational science research uh, summer school, uh, together with Ian Gent and Tristan Henderson. And also, I used my fellowship to attend a meeting of GAP developers in Germany in Aachen. So that was briefly my program for the first year of the fellowship. What was happening next? I went to collaborations workshop in 2015. I, uh, th that was my second workshop, and I already knew what will happen there during the hack day. And we assembled the team jointly with Sarah Mount, another fellow of SSI, and Divasina in Pakutika to work on a Docker container for GAP. So that was a project which happened as a hack day, and now it led to established a like, pipeline of Docker containers which we are using as an alternative GAP distribution. So that happened to be very useful. Uh, project and now we are linking it with Jupyter Notebook so we can provide an environment using which you can easily deploy user-friendly GAP instance on any machine which supports Docker. I went to Software Credit Workshop in London in October 2015 because uh, I am quite interested in uh, citations of mathematical and general scientific software uh, doing this co collection and maintenance of the citations database for the GAP system. Uh, National Infrastructure Project Directors Group Software Workshop in Edinburgh, which was organized by Software System Built Institute, and Collaborations Workshop, which happened this year in Edinburgh, about which Vincent was telling us. So, reflecting on which uh, impact Software System Built Institute Fellowship had on my work, I would like to mention the following. It's great networking opportunity. So I met many new people, uh, fellows network, SSI staff, research software engineering net network. Also networking opportunities to speak to EPSRC and JISC representatives at various events. Next, software carpentry, data carpentry. Force 11 software citations working group, uh, which I joined last year. Then, because I went to the Microsoft Azure training course, I applied subsequently to the Microsoft Azure for Research Award, and now I'm using that grant for, for a project 
uh, which is called group numbers reproducibility project. So you can read the, about it using the link which is on this slide. So we are, it's a crowdsourcing project to reproduce certain mathematical uh, experiments. I became an associate editor of Journal of Open Research Software. Then jointly with Ian Gent and Tristan Henderson, we were successful in application for the SIGSA. SIGSA is Scottish Informatics and Computer Science Alliance. SIGSA means in Responsible Data Science. And we are planning to organize several workshops in the end of this year there. And uh, jointly with uh, others, including several SSI fellows, we co-authored a paper in close computational, bi computational biology, uh, 10 simple rules for taking advantage of Git and GitHub. And then, uh, finally, in 2014, we made an application for UPSRC Collaborative Computational Project, uh, for which Steve Linton is a PI, and I became a co-I. And I think very much that, like, I, I, I obtained a broader view on many things due, due to my SSI fellowship, and it helps me to describe them in a proper way in grant application. So we have now a project which runs for five years since March last year. It includes software maintenance, collaborative visits, training, and dissemination. We run a very successful training school in Manchester uh, last year, and the next one will be happening in uh, ICMS Edinburgh next month. And uh, to take GAP teaching to the next level, as Shaib already mentioned, I developed a software carpentry lesson on GAP. And currently, uh, GAP SageMath lesson is in uh, preparation. So, uh, and now I would like to just speak a little bit more about software carpentry. So, in my application had no software carpentry in it at all. And uh, my application was actually based around their computation project. But naturally, I came to software carpentry later because SSI is involved in software carpentry as UK-wide coordinator. So my story is that I started as a helper at the workshop in St. Andrews, which we organized in May 2015. Then uh, learning the teaching methodology of software carpentry uh, helped me a lot when I developed the GAP lesson for software carpentry. And uh, also, at the end, a uh, number of SSI fellows be becoming involved in software carpentry workshop as helpers or authors. They are getting into training as software carpentry or data carpentry instructors. So I attended my instructor training in May 2016. I still didn't complete some post-workshop assignments, so I will get the official certification when I will complete them. So you see that, uh, in general, software carpentry is usually embedded in about a half of shortlisted fellowship applications in the form of running software carpentry style workshops in your institutions or maybe in your research groups uh, UK-wide in your domains. And uh, also you can either develop new teaching materials or you can assemble a tailored workshop using ready uh, software carpentry uh, lessons. So I would say that you see, because software carpentry is embedded in about a half of shortlisted applications, it probably doesn't increase or decrease your chances if you have this element or not. It's just a question that if it fits into your proposal, into the program of your work during the first year of fellowship, then it fits. And if, if not, that not. So if you will be considering software carpentry route in your application, then I put two lessons, here, two links here. One of them is the link to existing lessons, and then you can assemble two or three day workshop uh, dependently on the needs of your community or research group. And another one is lesson incubation. Lesson incubation is the procedure used by soft software carpentry to create new lessons and get the community of uh, contributors and uh, uh, instructors around them who are qualified to teach those lessons because developing lesson is one work but writing lesson in such a way that anybody else could study it and deliver the same quality of uh, teaching is another work and so that's my talk and I wish you all successes in your applications Um, <clears throat> excellent. Thank you. Dan. Excellent. Thanks very much. Um, and as you can see, that's a real 
real value of um, uh, Alexander was able to ma maintain real value for himself and for the institute and for his community by by his continual engagement. And not everyone can do that, but we we do we are set up to support to support that. Okay, so um, it's on to the uh, uh, Fellows 2016 uh, Q&A. Um, <clears throat> Unfortunately, due to a, a glitch in the uh, in the webinar platform, it seems to have limited the number of attendees um, that can join. So there's another 11 or so people who've been in touch uh, that they can't connect, and I don't know how many people have not been in touch who couldn't connect. Um, but a recording will be made available, uh, and we may have a follow-up session where we just have an open discussion. We shall see. Uh, but if you do have any questions for those who are uh, did uh, were able to make it, um, if you can put them in the Etherpad, uh, and the address is there. Um, actually, uh, if you do have, uh, so I will load up the Etherpad. Uh, there's the Etherpad address. As there's uh, only a few of you on. Um, if you want to, uh, you can raise your hand, I can unmute you if you do have a question, uh, and you could ask the question uh, verbally if you don't want to type it into the etherpad. So if any of the people who are on, uh, I think that's Alexandra, uh, Asif, and Marcus, if you do have any questions. Um, then uh, please do ask. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of minutes. So while people are thinking of, of potential questions, um, and before I thank people, uh, I wanted to just highlight a couple of things about what the fellowship isn't. Um, so the fellowship isn't really, uh, we've talked a lot in the webinar about what the fellowship is and sort of activities that it's supported and this is certainly fleshed out by uh, the fellows uh, giving their um, information about the events that they'd attended and organized. Um, but just to highlight this fact because sometimes um, we get applications for, uh, for this, um, it's not really there to support staff effort as it were. If, you're, if you want to say, well, I want to spend three days developing this piece of code, uh, it's not really for that. That's more um, our open call territory where we offer consultancy and uh, staff time of our own to help you uh, with development. So it's not about paying for staff time. No, it's not about paying for hardware either. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, those are the, the, the two types of things that it's not really uh, focused on. But if you do have a question about whether you think a particular type of activity uh, is eligible or not, then please do email us uh, on info at software.ac.uk. Uh, the slides will be made, made available after the um, after the webinar, probably uh, on Monday. Okay. Um, let me just see if there's been any questions. So I don't believe there's been any questions. Um, that's fine. Um, any any other questions that people have, uh, they can ask um, at the uh, by, by emailing us. Okay. Well, thank you for those who uh, attended, um, and especially thanks for the fellows who took the time out to uh, prepare some, prepare the presentations and to uh, and to present to the community. Um, like I said, a recording will be made available, and it will be uh, of use. Uh, to, to those who couldn't couldn't make it in today, uh, and thank you to the institute team uh, for the help with the webinar, help with slides and uh, and information. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, and any questions, please get in touch with us at info at software.ac.uk, or uh, you can always message us on Twitter at software saved. Thank you, and bye bye.